turn on, tune in, and drop out. Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about dropout regularization. So dropout is a regularization technique that helps to prevent overfitting by randomly dropping out, which means setting to zero, certain activations during training. And so this method and what also became known as dropout comes from these two papers by Hinton and Associates and Srivastava and Associates. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And a fun fact, I'm not sure how fun it is, but actually, according to Wikipedia, Google holds the patent for this technique. So it's probably not valid because it was described as dilution in previous papers. Okay, so what is dropout? So suppose this is our neural network. This is our architecture. And so each neuron in the neural network will have a certain probability P, which is a hyperparameter, to be deactivated, basically to be dropped out, to be zeroed out, which means that all of the, its inputs and all of its outputs will not matter. And so all of the weights of that neuron will not matter for that round. So in each training round, in each training batch, different neurons will shut down and the other neurons will train regularly, but these neurons and their associated weights will not uh, train. They will be fixed as they were before. Okay, so let's say in a certain round, this neuron is shut off, this neuron is shut off, all their associated connections shut off. So when training, the loss will not propagate through these connections, right? Because the results of here will be zero, the results of here will be zero, the function will not depend on these results. So remember we saw in the back propagation video, suppose we want to see what, how the weight of this connection gets updated. So it will take the loss, the derivative of the loss with regards to the last activation, the derivative of the last activation with regards to the inputs to the activation, right? So this is Z and then it comes out A and then it comes out into the loss, right? Okay, and then finally, we take the derivative of Z with regards to W, but this will just be the last activation. It will be the activation that came here. Okay, so A, L minus one, three, and here the output will be zero. So this whole thing will be zero and there will be no learning happening for this node. And the same will happen for this node, okay? So once you zero out the neurons, there is no training happening on their connections. Now at test time, you activate all the neurons and you have your final network and you just use it for predictions. Okay, so what is the intuition behind this dropout? Why does it work? Um, so there are two justification for why dropout makes your neural network more robust, has low variance and it overfits less. The first intuition is that each neuron cannot rely too heavily on the other neurons. And so it prevents what is called co-adaptation. And the origin of this theory is in biology. So here is a quote from the papers. Over the long term, the criterion for natural selection may not be individual fitness, but rather mix ability of genes. The ability of set of genes to be able to work well with another random set of genes makes them more robust. Since the gene cannot rely on large set of partners to be present at all times, it must learn to do something useful on its own or in collaboration with a small number of other genes. So this is the inspiration from biology, and then they connect it to neural networks. Similarly, each hidden unit in a neural network trained with dropout must learn to work with a randomly chosen sample of other units. This should make each hidden unit more robust and drive it towards creating useful features on its own without relying on other hidden units to correct its mistake. And this reliance is what is called the co-adaptation. And they explain a bit further, the derivative received by each parameter tells it how it should change so the final loss function is reduced, given what all the other units are doing. Therefore, units may change in a way that they fix up the mistakes of the other units. This may lead to complex co-adaptations. This in turn leads to overfitting because these co-adaptations do not generalize to unseen data. We hypothesize that for each hidden unit, dropout prevents co-adaptation by making the presence of other hidden units unreliable. Okay, so this is one theory of what's going on and why this dropout works. Another theory is that what we are actually doing is we are using an ensemble of networks. So think of it like this. Each round of training, you are randomly selecting a sub-network within the big network that you have, right? So one round, it could be that we just chose these, this networks yeah, without the grayed out 
connections, but maybe the next round, this will go off and this will go off. So we will have this and we will have this, but we won't have these two. So each training round, we are having a different subnetwork. And so we can think of it as kind of an ensemble method and ensemble methods in general are more robust and have lower variance and they don't overfit so much. And to quote the paper, a good way to reduce the error on the test set is to average the predictions produced by a very large number of different networks. The standard way to do this is to train many separate networks and then to apply each of these networks to the data set. But this is too computationally expensive. So random dropout makes it possible to train a huge number of different networks in a reasonable time. So this is kind of an ensemble. It's not exactly an ensemble because, for example, it's not like each network starts from a random position. No, each network gets the weights from the previous round. So there's a form of weight sharing between the networks. And also in an ensemble, you take the weighted mean decision of the ensemble. Here you take the final network, which is called the mean network uh, that contains all the units. Uh, you scale it a bit. We'll talk about it in a second. But the, the writers claim that in practice, this gives a very similar performance to averaging over a large number of dropout networks. There's also a paper that shows some equivalence between ensemble networks and dropout under certain conditions. I have to say, I'm not super convinced by this paper, but maybe you will be. Okay, so this is another explanation of why dropout works. There are two main theories. Um, there are also some variants of dropout. There is something called drop connect, which instead of dropping entire neurons, just randomly drops weight. So instead of dropping this neuron and all of its connections, so without this connection and without this connection, no, we we don't drop the neuron, we're just dropping the weight. So this weight randomly was chosen to uh, shut off this weight, this weight, this weight, this weight, etc. Another possible variant is adding noise. So dropout can be viewed as adding noise to the hidden units, right? Because we're randomly switching them off. And the idea of adding noise to the inputs, okay? So to the first layer uh, was a known way to improve generalization. It's been around for a long time. Uh, you can check Bishop Neural Network for Pattern Recognition, section 9.3, and also the paper mentioned in one of the in one of the dropout papers called Denoising Autoencoders by Vincent and Associates from 2008. Okay, so the last important thing about dropout is that you have to scale, you have to adjust the network either in validation time or training time. So if we drop some neurons from a layer, the next layer is used to receive lower values, okay, lower absolute values. So for example, if we are switching off units with a probability of 0 0.5, then the w next layer is used to receiving about half of the um, outputs of the previous layer. And if in test time, it will get double the amount and it can go crazy. And in an extreme case, if P is equal to 0 0.9, then the next layer at test time will be getting 10 times bigger values. So we need to scale the outputs of a dropout. We can either do that in test time by multiplying the outputs of each layer that had dropout by one minus P. Yeah, so again, if P was 0 0.9, then in test time, we are multiplying the outputs of this layer by 0 0.1. Or we can do what is called inverted dropout. And instead in training time, we'll be dividing by one minus P, which is the same as multiplying by one over one minus P. Okay, so already in training time, we are telling it, hey, scale up the outputs of this layer so that the next layer in test time will be used to the magnitude of the outputs that it will have. Okay, this is called inverted dropout. It has more advantage over the regular dropout. One of it is that you're able to change the dropout level over the training period. So suppose that we want in the beginning to have a high level of dropout and then in the end to reduce the dropout or vice versa. We can't do this uh, with the regular dropout where we just where we just scale at test time, but we can do this if we are already scaling at training time. And also this is what PyTorch is doing. Okay, so let's switch into code. Okay, these are libraries that we will need, NumPy, Matplotlib. We will use Torch for neural networks. Uh, Torch Vision, we will use a data set from it, the MNIST data. And we also need to transform because we have to transform that data. 
this is for plotting, this is for setting, this is for reproducibility, setting a manual seed. The data is the MNIST data. It's 28 by 28 pixel grayscale images of handwritten digits from zero to nine. The training set has about 60,000 images. The test set has about 10,000. Okay, what this code does, it tells it to download it to this folder and download the training data and do this transform, okay? And transform the data, which is a peel object into a tensor, which is a D-dimensional array. Okay, so we do it for the training data, we do it for the validation data. If we look at a single observation, okay, so this is the first observation, and we say take the features, take the X, not the Y, and then we plot it, it looks like this, it looks like a five. Just to verify it, let's take the first observation and the label, and indeed it's five, the overall dimension of each observation is 784. It's 28 by 28 by one because there's only one color channel here. We will also use data loaders, which help us shuffle the data and batch it into small batches. In this case, a batch size of 64. And now we will create a simple neural network, which will take the image, flatten it out, pass it through one linear network, then a ReLU activation, then a second linear network, which finally projects to the number of classes we have. We have 10 classes here, zero to nine. We don't need a softmax output because for the loss, it will be done automatically. And for predictions, uh, out of these 10 outputs, we choose the one with the highest number, okay? So this is a regular network. To add dropout, the only thing you do is you create a new dropout layer and you pass your outputs through it. Okay, so here we only have one hidden layer. Once the, we take the outputs of this hidden layer and we pass it through a dropout layer, and then we pass it through the second linear layer. And this takes care of the dropout. We do need to give it some dropout probability. I set it to be equal to 0.5 by default and I didn't change it. These will be the input dimension, hidden dimension, and the final output dimension. I'm instantiating two networks. Note that each of these networks has about 400,000 weights. So it's much more than the 60,000 data points. It doesn't have to be that it's overfitting, but, but overfitting is a possibility here. Okay, maybe with even more expressive networks, the dangers of overfitting are more acute, but here there is some danger of overfitting. And we will train both networks. The training is exactly the same. We use the cross entropy loss, which already adds the softmax layer by itself. Uh, we use the Adam optimizer. We keep track of both the train and the validation accuracies. We train for 10 epochs. We do a forward pass, then a backward pass. Then we predict, we just take the argmax, the um, value out of the 10 values for each observation. It gives you a 10 values. We choose the, we choose the maximum of it. If it's the first one, we will get a zero. If it's the 10th one, we will get a nine. And these will be our predictions. Then we calculate the accuracy. We say, are the predictions equal to the actual labels? We sum up all the ones that are, we divide by the total number that were, we multiply it by a hundred to get percentage, and we add this up. We do exactly the same for the validation set, okay? These are the results from the time that I trained. If I plot the training accuracy and the validation accuracy, we can see that the training accuracy went much higher than the validation, and even the, the validation starts to go down after a certain point, which may be an indication of overfitting. And then we do exactly the same for the dropout. The only difference is that I use the dropout model instead of the simple model. And now if I plot the train versus validation accuracy, we can see that they are much more closer and that the validation still improves. It doesn't look like it's going down. And finally, if I plot only the validation loss of the simple and the dropout networks, we can see that the dropout overall seems to be better than the simple and that the dropout also seems to improve more while the simple network without the dropout seems to deteriorate. Okay, so it seems that overall, even for this simple network, uh, dropout already improved the performance on this classification problem. So this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one. Turn on, tune in and drop